Good afternoon, everyone. I am Michael Steelman, Director of Alumni Career Management and Professional Networks at William & Mary. I am delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, Transform Your Life, How to Stay Positive, Reduce Stress, and Improve Your Health. Today's webinar is part of the William & Mary Alumni Webinar Series and is made possible by the support of the William & Mary Alumni Association. As we seek to provide relevant programming for our lifelong commitment to our alumni, we welcome any feedback and ideas to make this a valuable resource for you. Today's presentation is being recorded. And we will notify registrants once the recording is available. Just a few housekeeping items before I introduce our guest presenter. It's important to note that if you are experiencing any audio or video difficulties, to please call the Adobe Connect technical support at 1-800-422-3623. Also, questions are welcome, and our presenter will answer as many questions as time will allow. Please go ahead and just submit your questions by typing in the box just below the PowerPoint presentation. Throughout the webinar, I will monitor the questions and share them with our presenter at the end of her presentation. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest presenter today. Rebecca Staten Reinstein uh, is president of Advantage Leadership, Inc. She works with leaders and organizations to execute robust strategic plans, engage team members, and delight customers. Rebecca works with people around the world to think more critically and strategically and communicate more effectively, efficiently, and compellingly. Rebecca is the author of numerous books, including How-To Guides to Strategic Planning and Conventional Wisdom, How Today's Leaders Plan, Perform, and Progress Like and the Founding Fathers, and combining her love of history honed in Williamsburg as a guide for the restoration and business world. Rebecca received her BS in biology from our very own William & Mary School of Arts and Sciences and has an MA from Indiana University and a PhD in organizational development from the Union Institute and University. We are truly de delighted to have Rebecca come back and join us again for a, her second webinar with us this afternoon from Florida to share her advice around transforming your life. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh for the nice introduction, Michael. Uh, now, I don't know about you, although I suspect that you may be experiencing a little more stress than ever before. In fact, the data show us that at work, people are working longer hours, they're taking less vacation, and they really are relaxing less. And as I go around and visit clients uh, around the country, and in fact, around the world, I'm seeing more and more levels of stress in people. And one of the things that we notice is that even when people are, quote, relaxing, they're doing more things like extreme sports or arduous workouts, which unfortunately are adding to not alleviating their stress. Do more with less. That, that's kind of the mantra I hear everywhere. And stress. Uh, caused diseases are on the increase. So the question is, is there anything we can do about this? Well, that's the whole point of this webinar. Transform your life by staying positive, reducing stress, and improving your health. Just to give you a quick picture of who I am, uh, that's me uh, back in the day and Colonial Williamsburg when I was a guide through all of our historical buildings. And that's me again, an 18th century uh, guy. Uh, recently, as I was promoting my book on the Constitutional Convention. Now, back in the day uh, at William and Mary, I was a biology major and Spent a lot of time in the old greenhouse. And to round out my education, I also took some psychology classes. And I happened to take them in the Wren building. And we sat on those very uncomfortable benches to do our work. And of course, the tourists would wander through the middle of it quite often, thinking it was very quaint that they had asked us to pretend to be students. But anyway, today's webinar, I'm going to try to weave together both the uh, disciplines as we try to understand where does the stress come from and how do we alleviate it. So we're going to look at a little science, a little social science, 
and hopefully some nice practical solutions that are going to help you understand how you can stay more positive and transform your life and dump some of that stress. To get started, I'd like to do a quick quiz with those of you who are on live with us today. And what are the things that are stressing you? What are the kind of stresses you have at work, at home, at li from life in general? And we'll certainly look at uh, a few of those over the course of today. I'll give you a couple of moments to add your, your ideas. Okay, great, thanks. So it looks like we have a lot of typical stresses that affect us today. Uh, including things like multiple roles, conflicting objectives, feeling kind of stuck, health, ah, a big one, yes, finances, lack of progress, time management. Oh, gosh, sounds like I wrote these <laughs> myself. But seriously, they're, they're not unusual. They're the same ones that so many of us uh, have and have to deal with. The other thing is, and I think it follows from all these, is that quite often our workplace has become toxic. There's stresses that come to us just because of the nature of, of the work and the way in which things are organized at work. So I want you to think about whether your workplace is big time toxic or maybe just kind of moderately so, and think about which of the stresses are you handling okay, and which ones are, are giving you real problems. Because we'll try to spend some time, hopefully, talking about the things that are most, most important to you. One of the first things I want to suggest that you do to get started on relieving some of this stress is to find some time to sit down, give some thought to what's stressing you out day in and day out, both at life or work, it really doesn't matter. And then see if you can identify the causes of the stress, not just the effect that you notice, but can you identify uh, whether they're physical or mental effects? Right? All, all sorts of them. And then figure out what, what's the root cause. It may, in fact, not be what is obvious. So kind of dig deep and see if you can figure out what's the real cause of this particular type of mental or uh, physical stress that I'm experiencing. Because you can't really relieve the stress until you can identify its cause. Now, there's some things we can do to reduce it, but getting rid of those root causes ultimately may be the, uh, the panacea, the thing that works best. So we're looking at what kind of tips that balance. And that's why we say it's so important to first identify what those uh, stresses are, what that negativity is, and then think about, well, which ones of these could I change? Which ones am I going to have to kind of adapt to? And which ones that I, I can't adapt to and I can't really change, can I frame them in a different way in which I think about them? So that that can help relieve the stress. And then consider the toll these negative elements are taking on you. How urgent is, you, is it for you to start acting? And this is important because stress and negativity affect our health. And it's not just, by the way, the long term. There are a lot of short term things that we often experience when it comes to the way in which this stuff affects us. Okay, now don't panic at all of this on the screen. 
I just put these uh, illustrations up here so that I can talk to you a little bit about the biology, right? We're going to have our two minutes, uh, maybe a minute and a half biology lesson. Here's what's really happening inside your body. There's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And when we're under stress, it sends out messages, sends them to the pituitary glands. And then the pituitary gland is, uh, in turn sends out a message to the adrenal glands. And they produce what's known as the stress hormone, cortisol. And it starts affecting uh, your liver, uh, body fat, uh, lymphocytes, muscle, on and on and on. In fact, all kinds of parts of your body. And at some point, these high levels of stress uh, are so much that they send a message back to the pituitary and to the hypothalamus saying, whoa, we've got Let's let's turn this off. We're not we don't really need any more cortisol. And that's for those short term stresses, those things that hit and run. It lasts for a little bit and then it goes. And this is the natural cycle, by the way. And it's important because the adrenal glands sending out that cortisol prepare you, help your body get ready to deal with the stress. To deal with the situation. So when that's working just fine, everything's okay. The problem is when it becomes chronic, when it's day in and day out. And those are some of the things you had mentioned before the, that cause your con chronic stress at work. You talked about uh, the, sh the shifting or confusing goals and priorities and objectives, the way too much work, the financial worries, all of those things that keep going on and on, feeling stuck where you are in, in your life, your job, all of those things then cause this cycle not to turn off. And that's when the problems begin. For us. And let's look at some of these. Uh, I pull these quickly from an article uh, by a uh, a woman named Debbie McGowan called The Ten Effects of Chronic Stress on Your Health. And what we're talking about is not the momentary stress, but those things that keep going on. And of course, they cause the anxiety, which keeps this cycle going. It can lead to depression. And of course, we know longer term, all those cardiovascular diseases, sleep disturbance messing up your sleep patterns, sudden or major weight gain or loss, either one can be a sign that this is chronic and going on. Cognitive impairment, the fuzzy brains. I don't know about you, this is one that affects me when I'm under stress. I suddenly find myself unable to remember simple things. I forget easy stuff. I get very confused. And of course, gastrointestinal problems of all sorts. It feeds the addiction cycle and causes fertility problems, including ED. And since your immune system is compromised by all this, much more likely that you're going to catch that cold or that bug that's going around rather than be able to resist it. So all of these things happen. Uh, I, at one point, I took a job that, let's say I was well, I was not particularly well suited for, and that was high pressure, high stress, and I suddenly developed bursitis. Now, I'd never had that particular ailment before, but I found that when I walked into the building, I would get these horrible pains and shooting pains down through my shoulder neck area. Guess what? Six months later, when I left that job, I never had a, one of those symptoms again. So sometimes those odd aches and pains that seem to come out of nowhere and don't necessarily have a real good diagnosis. 
Those are all the effect of way too much cortisol coursing through our bodies. All right, enough biology for the moment. I often like to start my webinars with this wonderful quote from Albert Einstein. The significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. And how that applies here is that we must always start by looking at our own contribution to the chronic stress. That's right. What am I contributing to this is the question I always have to ask myself. Do I need to do any, or am I doing things that make it worse? Am I doing things that are contributing in a big way to this stress that I'm feeling that in fact I can do something about? So what do we do to shift that balance towards the positive? What can you do? What actions can you take to relieve the stress? We're going to do another quick uh, quiz here now and ask you, what are your stress relieving strategies? What are the kind of things that you do to relieve that stress, especially the chronic stress, if not the, the shorter term versions? What are the same things that work for you? What are some of the things you've tried over the years? And let's see what folks have to say to that. Just add your contributions there at the, the box on your screen. To your stress relieving strategies. Okay. Ah. Let's see. Gardening. Yoga. Playing with the dog. Alone time. Quiet park with again with the dog. Walking. Reading, cleaning the house, okay? <laughs> uh, all of those are good because, you know, what, if, you, if you think about all of them, they have something in common. In most of these, you're moving around in some way. And just the actual physical movement can break up the pattern of the chronic stress. And, of course, interacting with animals of any kind is usually uh, not only uh, fun and, and enjoyable, but of course, as you know, today there's a lot of uh, work being done with uh, the use of animals to help people uh, deal with their, their stress and their situation. And of course, uh, yoga and just reading a good book are always great ideas. Here's some others that uh, many people found useful. Uh, working with kids in some way or or working for some good cause, you know, outside of work. Socializing with friends, going to have fun events, uh, spending time with the, with the family, uh, getting engaged in, in sports or games, uh, spending time one-on-one -on -one with, with a friend. By the way, getting enough sleep. This is critical. And once again, many, many people do not get enough sleep. Here's what the here's what the experts tell us. With very few exceptions, there's always a few outliers, the vast majority of us require, must have seven to eight hours of sleep regularly every night. Now of course you have to uh, eat healthily, uh, get enough exercise, and so forth. And that sleep, by the way, is so important because otherwise you're walking around sleep deprived and you don't notice it, but it takes a big toll on you. And as we've said before, yoga is always good. You know, martial arts, meditation, mindfulness exercises are also helpful. The key is to find something that you like and will do. It doesn't matter that activity X may be the greatest thing in the world for relieving stress, if you won't do it, it doesn't help you. So find something that gets you outside of yourself, gets you outside of your stress situation, and gives you that time and space 
to really recharge your battery. One of the other things I want to suggest to you as you're sitting down writing that list of your various, the effects of the stress and, and the root causes, is to think about what your strengths and challenges are when it comes to dealing with stress and negativity. Try looking for things that you can do to really use your strengths to mitigate your challenges. What are some activities or actions you can take to make sure that you maximize those strengths as you're trying to minimize those challenges? Now, one important thing to realize, and this is especially important in the work situation, is the difference between position power and personal power. At work, uh, there are folks with position power, and of course, depending on where that person or you are in the hierarchy. Uh, position power in the organization uh, gives you some things that you can do and control. What decisions you can control, how much budget you control, and other specific areas. And that's, of course, very important. But there's something that turns out to be even more flexible and more robust in terms of power and that's your personal power. This is your ability to communicate effectively, to influence other people, your ability to build strong relationships, your ability to lead from anywhere. So you don't have to have a title. The key is to exercise these strengths that you walk in with and figure out how to maximize and learn to use this personal power that you have very wisely. Because this will give you a big asset in terms of relieving your stress. Because it allows you to be influential on your environment and on other people, which in and of itself helps lighten the load a little. So the question always is, when we're talking about communication, is your communication clear? And I'll have a quick quiz for you. We're not going to put this one up on the screen, but you can mark it down there if you'd like. And this is based on the work of Albert Mirabian. Mirabian, there we go. And it's very, it has been published a lot, but it's also been misunderstood. But it's still a powerful understanding, so let's let's look at it. And he said there are three things that go into the message we're trying to send with our communication: our body language, our tone of voice, and the actual words we use. So take a quick guess for a moment. How much, what percentage do you think body language contributes to your message? What percentage does tone of voice contribute to the message? How about words? Right. Think about that for a moment. Take a good guess. And here are the answers. Are you surprised at all? The Robbian's important find was that all three of these things, body language, tone of voice, and words, have to be in sync. They have to agree. And if any one of them is out of sync, then your message gets muddled or confused or really sends a message to the person you're trying to communicate that you may not be telling the truth. You know, if, if you've ever been a card player, you know about gambling, you know that Gamblers always talk about people having a tell, something that is part of their body language, their tone of voice, or even the words they use that says, hey, I'm lying here. I'm not telling the truth. I'm, I'm out of sync. Now, overall in the message, the body language contributes 55%. The 
over half of it is nonverbal. A little over a third, 38%, is that tone of voice. And finally, the words are only 7%. That doesn't mean the words aren't important. It just means that the other things are massaging those words and sending perhaps a different message than you mean to send. And this becomes a, a problem for us as we try to counter the communication limitations we all face every day at work and at home. Because many of the newer ways of communicating are leaving us lacking with certain of these important elements. For example, when we're on Twitter or texting or emailing, we lose both tone and body language. Emojis don't quite make up for it. And therefore, we're often misunderstood. And in fact, because in these newer forms of communication, you kind of shorthand everything, the communication becomes a lot more blunt. A lot, uh, all the social niceties kind of filter away. And in fact, the other person reading the message may get very angry at it or may be upset by it because they misinterpret it. Because there's no other context for understanding the words. So we want to look for ways to more fully engage. Of course, face-to-face -face is always the best, but with technology, we can get pretty close with uh, our platforms that we have out there today. Your company may have some. There are a lot of free ones around where you can actually see the other person as well as hear them. And that's important for getting both the body language, the tone of the voice, as well as the actual words that we're saying. Now, while we're communicating, we have to quiet our mind and give them full attention. You're not seeing me and I'm not seeing you in this particular webinar. Are you sitting there twiddling with your email? Are you doing some other things? It's easy enough, especially on our conference calls and so forth. When I'm not quieting my mind and giving full attention to the other person, I'm going to miss out on some of the communication. And another important aspect is to ask a lot of questions. And then repeat things. Make sure you understand. Uh, let me see if I understand what you're saying. As I get it, you're trying to say this. So that back and forth, which really refines that communication and makes sure you're really clear about it. So what holds us back? Why aren't we just doing this? It seems like common sense. Well, another quick biology lesson, if you'll excuse me. And that's about the amygdala. It's a little structure buried deep in the bottom of our brain, right next to the hypothalamus, uh, which is that green thing on your screen. And it works closely with it. We, we call the amygdala the lizard brain. And it's constantly scanning the environment, looking for threats. It's all it does day in and day out. So think about it. You're driving down the highway, and a truck starts to veer into your lane. What do you do? Well, what are some of the symptoms that you feel in your body? Uh, you may find that you're breathing more shallowly. You may find that your uh, stomach and your muscles start to tense up. You may find that things kind of slow down. And in fact, you probably hit the brake or turn the wheel before you even realize that, the, that oh my gosh, the truck's about to cream me here. And that's the old amygdala at work. Because the amygdala with the hypothalamus are the center of fight or flight. They're the things that they send out those messages to all parts of the body to get us ready for those situations. And they save our lives. However, there's one small problem. They can't distinguish between the truck about to run over us on the highway and somebody saying something we really don't like. Somebody verbally attacking us. 
is the same as a tiger jumping out of the bush. And so that thing that saves our lives in real uh, threatening situations sabotages us in day-to-day -day communication. So our key is to recognize what are those things that trigger that fight or flight response and then do something about them because this is really the source of that cortisol and other hormones streaming through our bodies day in and day out. And Wayne Bridges gives us uh, some indications of some real insights into how to manage the old amygdala. When we're in that flight mode, well, we're often in denial. Well, things aren't really so bad. It's not going, you know, uh, it's really not as bad as they think. Uh, and I have to recognize when there is a real problem. And I have to then realize what it, what that problem is doing to me physically as well as mentally or emotionally. And most of us have a tendency to either go for the flight or the fight uh, when, when we're under stress. If you go for the threat or for a fight, then you're liable to get into that resistance mode and find yourself in an argument, in these endless arguments that just don't seem to go anywhere. You go round and round the same points. And as you do that, what's happening? The cortisol is rushing, but you're not getting any place. And so both with fight and flight, nothing is happening. So where I want to get is into the zone of exploration, sometimes called the neutral zone. And what I want to do here to get there, first of all, I have to take a deep breath, count to 10, do, do whatever it is you need to do to kind of calm and center yourself so that the other person will eventually calm down. And then I can't force somebody there, but what I can do is get them there by asking good questions. Really asking questions such as, well, you know, you've got an interesting point there. I'm wondering, blah, blah, blah. Uh, gosh, I understand why you feel that way. Could we explore that a little further? Using that kind of questioning, more neutral tone of voice, uh, conditional language, could we explore this? What do you think? And really move us in there so we get that dialogue going. Once that dialogue gets going, then we're going to end up at some place where we resolve the issue. We're in that area of acceptance. We, we've come to some conclusion. So this is going to be critical and recognizing your triggers so you don't go there or when you go there, you can back off. Very important. So suppose you're a manager, and I know some of you on the uh, call are today. You, whatever your title, you, you have other people who report to you. Then your highest purpose is to create a positive environment, and you have the ability to do that no matter where you sit in the hierarchy. Even if you only have a small team or maybe one person, you can create a positive environment. And here's how you go about doing it. You want to do things that actually build the team. And to get that started, you want to respect one another and set those rules of inspect, uh, respect. You know, very simple. Uh, you just have to play by the other person's rules. Oh, wait a minute. I can't use my own rules of respect. I have to find out what that other person's are and use those rules. That's how it gets going. And of course, simply reward in any way you do that just by a thank you. The positives that people do and work on getting those negatives extinguished by reframing things and making them into a positive. And of course, model the kind of good communication you want to do as well as the behavior. Now, conflict is normal. And conflict itself is not a problem. 
In fact, mastering conflict is what great teams do. And we have another quick quiz for you here. It's a true or false quiz. And let's look at each question and see how we do on it. And the first question is the most successful teams have very little conflict. Ah, boy, you guys are batting a thousand a day. Yes, uh, that's false. The best teams are made up of people who are comfortable passionately arguing for their ideas. Oh, I can't, I can't fool you guys today. Absolutely. Uh, that's true. No matter what their cultural background and family norm, people generally feel the same way about conflict. They prefer to avoid it. Ah, I finally caught you. No, this is false. And finally, understanding team members' differing experiences with and feelings about conflict helps a team engage in unfiltered, productive debates. Yes, that's true. The one in, in, that that everybody missed, uh, no matter what their cultural background and family norms, people generally feel the same way about conflict. They prefer to avoid it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that is true. I didn't get that one wrong. <laughs> well, so you guys were ahead of me on all of this. Terrific way to go. All right, so you understand these basics. And many of these are found in a wonderful book by uh, called the five dysfunctions of a team and i'm going to show it to you i think at the end when we have our uh, references so let me give you some practical state steps then for helping reduce resolve a conflict and there's three parts of this that are more important than anything else and the first one is the first step defining the problem you have to sit down with the other person, and I usually allow them to go first. So, and again, even if they're not calm, cool, and collected, if they're angry and upset and so forth, I still allow them to define the problem. And then I come back with my definition, and we eventually come to a definition of what is the problem really. If I can't get beyond step one, conflict's not going to get resolved. So step two is when we finally agree on it and we write that problem description down. And we write it down. Now we have to agree on a common goal. And that's the second part of this uh, process that is critical because if we don't do this, we're not going to go any further. And by the way, when you look at some of the conflicts around the world that just seem to go on and on and on, it's because they can't agree what the problem is, but they can't agree on the common goal. And these two particular steps are critical. If you can't do these, it's going to go on. All right. But once we agree on the common goal, then again, we're going to look for the root causes of the problem. We're going to, not just the symptoms, we're going to kind of dig deep. We're going to verify those root causes, kind of test them out, see what they are, and then pick a solution. And by the time you figure out root causes, a lot of the solutions are, are pretty obvious. And then we actually put it in play and evaluate it. And this is the, the third big piece of this. I have to have some way to measure that it actually is solving or moving towards solving the problem. And once we have done that, then we're going to communicate it to whoever needs to be communicated. So the critical pieces are defining the problem together, agreeing on the goal, and after you've found the root cause and come up with some solutions, being able to measure it or evaluate it as you put it into play. And by this point, if the solution isn't 100%, and then you go back and look for another one, another root cause that, that needs address. So the question I'm always asking, whether I'm the team leader or the team member, is are we an effective team? And it's important to look for ways to help the team become more effective. 
Is the team resolving the problem? Are you resolving the problem? Are you achieving all you could? Once again, trying to get on that common path together and using your personal power to help the team achieve that. So your job as an individual team member, if you're not the team leader of some sort, then of course is to support that positive environment. And most of what we've been talking about all along applies to individuals as well as the people who manage others. And by the way, it's never an excuse for bad behavior to say, well, my boss is doing this, so I can do that. We, we can't control our feelings or our emotions and so forth, but we can control how we behave. And so if I'm going to reduce stress, I have to look for ways to support my team members, work with others. And by the way, it's pretty much the same as before. I'm going to look for ways that I can support my team. So you don't have to like your teammates. That, that's not necessary. But you do have to look for ways to work effectively and communicate with them. And realize I can't control them. I can influence them with my personal power. But my job is to support my teammates and do whatever I can to create that more positive environment. And again, playing by their rules of respect, looking at positives. Uh, in fact, we often call this creating new legends, uh, retelling those old stories. Uh, when we say be alert for negative, that means we've got to stop gossiping. I know how much fun it is. I love to gossip. But guess what? It just usually keeps those old stories circulating, and they're usually at the expense of someone. So what I want to do is convert them into a positive. I'll give you a quick trivial example. A bunch of friends and I uh, went to an outdoor concert uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, we had we were able to have a picnic beforehand, and we really enjoyed ourselves and having a grand time. About 15 minutes before the concert started, the skies opened up and we had to kind of run for shelter. And we looked on our phones, of course, immediately and found out that this storm wasn't going to pass anytime soon. So there was no hope that that concert was going to go on. Well, when I run into those folks, and I just ran into them again yesterday, they were still talking about yeah, it was so bad. We missed the concert. It was terrible. Oh, the rain, blah, blah, blah. My answer is always the same. Yeah, but we had a great picnic. Wasn't that fun? Didn't so-and-so bring a delicious cake? All of those ways of reframing things so that they're no longer just focusing on the negative. And that is very powerful. And of course, being a good teammate, I want to look for opportunities to ease their workload. Look for things where I can pitch in and give them a little help. Go that extra mile. And one of the most powerful things we can do is to stop telling the negative story. And as I've said, those that make others look bad. So reframing it and telling it in a different way. Interrupt the pattern. Now, self-awareness is a very valuable asset. And because we're human, we constantly forget. So we get into our fight or flight mode easily. I have to always be bringing myself back to look for those triggers. I have to look for those things so that I can honestly recognize what I need to do, what I need to change to get that situation back on the right track. But sometimes you can't do anything uh, to get the other person or the uh, situation to move in a positive direction. 
and that's when when you have to kind of work around it. Uh, you want to look for ways to avoid getting drawn into these traps of negativity. And at some point, you may decide maybe the best thing for me is to move on. Always an outside choice. So relieving stress is learning about reaching out. Somebody's got to be the grown-up here. Might as well be you. And it's immaterial who's at fault, who started it. You know, that that's for those discussions back down in the sandbox. We're grown-ups. We really have to be the ones who take the initiative. Always be the first one to move and look for ways to de-stress the situation. And on the other hand, we really do have to refuse to be bullied. We have to refuse to take on the role of the victim. And I have to be assertive and firm. And I can, again, try to move the situation into the neutral zone, asking questions, trying to get a dialogue started, but being very assertive, and very firm. Because the last thing in the world I want to do is to fall into that victim mode. And I have to make a conscious decision not to do it. It's, it's a headset that you have to develop. Because the minute you allow yourself to be the victim, to be bullied, then your stress is going to go way up. And if you're in that situation day in and day out, it's going to cause you real physical as well as mental harm. It can be a hard habit to break, but we have to do it. Let me ask you this. Do you have a mentor? I do, and I've had one different mentors all of my adult life. And the reason is, first of all, most successful people do have mentors. It's because I need somebody to talk to, to bounce things off, ideas off of, somebody who's wiser than me. Somebody who is going to challenge me to be the best me I can be. And you may find them at work more often than not. You find them outside of work or in a professional organization or some uh, group or organization you belong to. But this is a person who you can really talk to and who can give you insights into yourself that you can't necessarily get. And they don't necessarily give you advice. Sometimes they do. But mostly they help you figure out what the next best step is. So you want to find that positive environment. You're going to do what you can do to build it. But if your efforts are futile, you have to consider finding another work environment, maybe in your own company or somewhere else. Remember, this planet's Stress is a killer. In fact, stress related ailments are the number one cause of death. You don't want to get caught in that bind. Let me give you one final set of quick hints. And that's the Morita approach. Morita is a Jap was a Japanese scientist, psychologist. And his approach is pretty simple to understand. It's not to always practice. It's three steps. And it not only relieves the stress, but you can apply it to almost everything. Know your purpose. Feel your feelings. Do what must be done. Humans need a sense of purpose. This is a well-established psychological fact. And what Marita said is have that clear purpose that you're trying to accomplish. And this could be for your whole life. It could be vis-a-vis -vis your career or for this particular interaction or encounter that we're having right now. This is going to be my guide for action. So I really have to know what do I want to get out of this conversation we're having, this encounter we're having, as well as my whole life, or my career, or with my family, or whatever. 
The second is to feel my feelings. I must acknowledge what those feelings are. I have to notice that I'm angry, that I'm upset, that I'm uh, on edge about something. I have to recognize that and acknowledge it because the amygdala and the hypothalamus are doing their job. But my job is to simply be an observer, to simply notice that it's happening and not to dwell on it, not to, to keep it going. Because every time I spend more time on it, I just reinforce it. I, I kick off the next round of it. And I also, I don't want to revisit it. I don't want to keep going back to it. I was in a meeting recently where somebody was going on and on about something that someone said to them 10 years ago. All this does is keep the old cortisol cycle roaring. Acknowledge it and move on. Because when I don't spend a lot of time focused on those feelings, guess what? They dissipate. So that then brings me to step three, do what must be done. Do what must be done. So what would advance my purpose in this situation? What would help reverse or reduce the negativity in this situation? What action, in other words, what should I say or do so that I'm moving towards my purpose? And then take that action that you need to take. So moving towards the goal, the first thing is we have to acknowledge what are my challenges? What are my issues? What are my attitudes? What are my feelings? What is going on here? And then I've got to make a decision. Am I going to be a victim or am I going to be proactive? Am I going to use my personal power to change this situation, to influence this situation, to reduce the stress? And then I have to identify, well, what? What is my resistance to changing my action or going with this new thing? And I have to create that plan, that action plan. And then I must be relentlessly pers persistent in moving through my three steps, cycle after cycle. Know your purpose, feel your feelings, do what must be done. So it's up to us as individuals. Sophocles, an old dead Greek guy, said knowledge must come through action. And I've tried to give you a few tips today about how to deal with some of the stress that you encounter, how to deal with these negative situations. And now it's your turn. Take a look at those things as you write down those events and those uh, causes. Figure out, what am I going to do? How am I going to use those strategies that I use to reduce stress? How am I going to use my personal power to deal with these things? And take them on one at a time. Find that practical path that will work for you. So I'm giving you a couple of resources. Uh, David Reynolds uh, wrote a book called Constructive Living which is really an introduction to Morita psychology. Very easy to read, straightforward, and actually a book that, that helped change my life. I was lucky enough to hear David Reynolds uh, in, a, in a seminar, and the introduction to Morita was, as I said, life-changing. William Bridges wrote tons of books, uh, Transitions, Managing Transitions, Surviving Corporate Transition, The Human Side of Organizational Change, all about great ideas on how to deal with and all of the changes that are going on in our lives that are stressing us out. I hope this has been helpful for you. And now let me ask you, do you have any questions? Rebecca, thank David, you so much. Any questions uh, for... in today? Great webinar and uh, always no, always a pleasure hearing your perspective on things and to help us balance our life and and uh, approach 
our stresses a bit strategically and better outcomes. So we have a few questions and, and I encourage if you, if you have a question, if we don't get to it in this time allotted, please do feel free to reach out to Rebecca. She's provided all her co contact information here. And as you can tell, she's a, a wonderful individual and, and very welcome to anybody in the, in the tribe community to reach out to her. Um, so one, one person's boss is a, a bit demanding, it sounds like, and uh, looking for suggestions on how this person's always uh, shooting off emails and, and about every little detail, perfectionist, it sounds like, um, wants to know, uh, you know, he, it sounds like he means well, but, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a bugging that person. Any, any thoughts on how to best approach the situation? Uh, yes, uh, and, and of course, short of ending up on the 11 o'clock news doing the turf walk, uh, one of the things that I found useful over the years is the, the person said something that I think the, the boss means well. And so the first thing to do is to help yourself get into that point of view, okay, what was the mean? Why did the person, why did the boss, uh, not why did they shoot off the email, that's what they did, but why did the person want this particular change or want me to do something different? What was really that good intention behind it? I talked about reframing, and this is going to be critical in a lot of stressful situations, especially uh, work situations where you, where you are dealing with. What was that good intention? What was the person trying to achieve with this? And that's kind of changing it in your own mind first. And then having the conversation with the boss in which you try to, again, here's using your personal power, your ability to communicate, your ability to influence others. To, now that you've got that pro positive spin on it, uh, hmm. This is what the boss was trying to accomplish here. So now I can talk to the boss and I can say, help me understand this. I, what were you trying to accomplish here? Now, again, you'll say this in your own words, but you're trying to find out what were you trying to accomplish? Or am I right in thinking that this was meant to do this or that? It's going back to that R of questioning, which gets people into that neutral zone of exploration. Now, I often talk about using uh, a couple of simple devices. Uh, the first one is to try to align with the person. The, the notion is, hmm, I understand what you're trying to do here. Help me figure this out. Or I'm not quite so sure what, what we're trying to do here. Now, the key here is that these aligning statements try to get us on the same side have to be truthful. Remember before I talked about the body language, the tone, and the words themselves all have to align. So you want to be totally in control of yourself so that you can get this going and get a dialogue going. And that's going to be part of it. The next is you do know more or less where they're going to go with this. And so you can't constantly be surprised and irritated that they're doing this. The third piece is figuring out what really needs to be done and what doesn't. You know, a lot of times, and I've had bosses like that, they just shoot off ideas and, and criticisms and so forth a mile a minute. They didn't really mean all of it. And it's having that discussion to figure out which are these important to do something right. about and which ones can I kind of let slide for a while. And again, I often wonderful advice. Um, I apologize. We, we're almost uh, just about out of time. I'm going to take a moment real quick to launch a survey for those of you that 
are joining us live. And for those who are watching the recording, please just click on the survey link and it should open in your browser. Uh, this will help us get some feedback from you about today's webinar and the overall program and ideas for future webinars that you would like us to uh, provide. Again, if you are alumni who have an expertise like Rebecca um, and want to share that with your fellow alumni community, we would love to hear from you and feel free to email me anytime. Uh, also a little shameless plug for our next online networking hour, a great way to meet people like Rebecca and others in the tribe uh, on May 10th. That's next Wednesday at 12 Eastern time, same time of day as the webinar. And uh, you can access that from any internet connection you have available. Um, it's text chats one-on-one -on -one with uh, fellow members of the tribe, uh, alumni, faculty, staff, students from all over the world. Um, and, you know, maybe, Maybe we have time for one more question, Rebecca, if you don't mind, just a few more minutes. And if, if people have to chime off, certainly understand that. Um, but, do, you know, these dialogues, at what point do they have to happen every time uh, that you're you're discussing? And what time, it, you know, won't that burn up uh, a lot of the time that we are stressed with and the time management needs and, and, and so forth? And, and at what point are we just always overthinking versus uh, allowing ourselves to... Um, move forward uh, in a more uh, time management uh, practical way. Oh, great question, Michael. First of all, again, this you have to understand the situation you're in. There's no universal answer. You have to understand, as I was saying before, about when to take action, and when to let it, let it slide. And that comes from knowing your situation, knowing the people you're interacting with. But when you decide to interact, when you decide to kind of take that next step and try to resolve it, remember it's pay me now or pay me later. If I allow these negative situations to go on and on and on, I'm paying the price. And maybe a 10 minute dialogue or conversation with the person would have alleviated that stress, would have turned that negativity around, would have relieved it, and it's going to pay for itself over and over again. And this is especially important when we're talking about work, our work colleagues or our bosses or uh, even dare I say our spouses, because if we don't relieve this, then this, it will keep continuing itself. You know, I gave you that quote from Einstein early on. Another one that's always attributed to him is doing the same thing over, getting the same result, and yet expecting a different result. And if I don't break up those patterns, if I don't do something that allows me to be calm, cool, and collected and affirming myself and my position, then I'm going to constantly be battered by these things. I have to take the initiative, look for my contribution to this situation, look for ways that I can change my contribution to something more positive, and engaging the other person. It will pay dividends. Now, there's some folks, in some situations, it's never going to change. And then I have to make that decision to move on. And that's not easy because it has economic consequences as well as others. And it's not something one does lightly. But you have to ask yourself, at the end of the road, is anybody going to write on your tombstone, Rebecca was a great corporate citizen? No problem. You have to think about you, your life, well, your with family, that, I think that's values, great advice to purpose. conclude this hour. Thanks again for everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for contributing another great webinar to the William Mary community. Um, I hope all of you have a wonderful weekend ahead and uh, feel free to email us with any questions. Uh, I'll be sending out the recording of this webinar to all registrants uh, once it's available online. Uh, again, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Take care.